The pain caused by new media and new technologies tends very much to fall into the category of referred pain, such as skin trouble caused by the appendix or the heart. As with all new technologies, pain creates a special form of space, just as they also create pain. It's very much a case again of Heinrich Hertz's law, the consequences of the images will be the images of the consequences. All new technologies bring on the cultural blues, just as the old ones evoke phantom pain after they have disappeared. The extreme provinciality of our ideas of seeing is a simple result of living in a visual environment. Man-made environments are always unperceived by men during the period of their innovation. When they have been superseded by other environments, they tend to become visible. We now see the visual world very plainly and begin to realize that other cultures, native and oriental, have been developed on quite different sensory plans. For not only is each sense an unique world, but it offers unique pleasures and pains. The extreme and pervasive tactility of the new electric environment results from a mesh of pervasive energy that penetrates our nervous system incessantly. The sense of touch had been anesthetized in the mechanical age, but today television is only one of the tactile agents transforming popular awareness. Of course, color TV is very much more tactile than black and white TV. Tactility is the integral sense, the one that brings all the others into relation. This sense is greatly enhanced by the polarized and feedback pattern of our new electric environment. This environment itself constitutes an inner trip collectively, without benefit of drugs. The impulse to use hallucinogens is a kind of empathy with the electric environment, but it is also a way of repudiating the old mechanical world. When one has been hurt by new technology, when the private person or the corporate body finds its entire identity endangered, by physical or psychic change, it lashes back in a fury of self-defense. When our identity is in danger, we feel certain that we have a mandate for war. The old image must be recovered at any cost. But as in the case of referred pain, the symptom against which we lash out may quite likely be caused by something about which we know nothing. These hidden factors are the invisible environments created by technological innovation. The old men from Iron Mountain have not a clue to the origins or persistence of war as a quest for that identity that is always threatened by technological innovations. They are quite aware of the vast research and development activities that are accelerated by war, but it has never occurred to them that the innovations resulting from this research and development are precisely the ones that obliterate the identity image, indispensable to peace and tranquility among nations. For example, the atom bomb, the fine flower of the scientific efforts spurred by the Second War, has hastened the arrival of software and automation that are swiftly undermining the entire industrial establishment so long devoted to hardware. Electric software abolishes the division between industrial worker and savant as much as between civilian and soldier. War is a principal motivational force for the development of science at every level from the abstractly conceptual to the narrowly technological. Modern society places a high value on pure science, but it is historically inescapable that all the significant discoveries that have been made about the natural world have been inspired by the real or imaginary military necessities of their epochs. The consequences of the discoveries have indeed gone far afield, but war has always provided the basic incentive. Violence in its many forms, as an involuntary quest for identity, has in our time come to reveal the meaning of war in entirely new guise. 
This is a dimension of war totally invisible to the old men from Iron Mountain. War is a sizable component in the educational industry, being itself a form of education. The United States is by far the most visually organized country in the history of the world. It was the only country that was ever founded on the basis of phonetic literacy for all. All of its political and business institutions assume the ground plan of this literacy. All of its production and consumption techniques are expressions of the same literacy, labels and classifications for everything and everybody. Clothing as an extension of the human skin is as much a technology as the wheel or the compass. Strangely, the world of fashion has never been approached from this point of view. Is it merely a boar war? Is it merely an attempt to add a bit of spice and variety to the monotony of life? Possibly the fact that there is no such thing as fashion in native societies may provide an approach to this question. In these societies, clothing indicates age and status and serves complex ritual functions that relate the energies of the tribe to cosmic forces as much as we relate our energies to tanks and airplanes. Clothing is power and the organization of human energy, both private and corporate. In tribal societies, they prize the integral power of the corporate far above the variations of the individual costume. In fact, when all members of the tribe wear the same costumes, they find the same psychic security that we do living in uniform, mechanized environments. Since our environments are so drastically uniform, we feel we can afford a wide play of private expression and behavior in costume. However, when we seek to rally the corporate energies for sharply defined objectives, we do not hesitate to impose uniforms. Games stand in relation to new technology, somewhat in the form of clothing. Radio and baseball were well matched, but television has killed baseball and advanced football and ice hockey. Baseball was quite incompatible with the television spectator's role of participation in tactile depth. Baseball insists on careful timing and one play at a time. English cricket would be equally futile in television since its plays are much less frequent. One of the peculiarities of an electric technology is that it speeds up this process of transformation. Instant and total rehearsal of all pasts and all processes enables us to perceive the function of such perpetual returns as one of purgation and purification, translating the entire world into a work of art. <laughs>